Hey parents, are you struggling to find the right balance when it comes to setting limits with your kids? If you are, you're not alone. There are so many reasons why it can be challenging to set the right kind of limits with kids, and most parents end up being either too lenient or overly strict. When children are frustrated, they're just gonna push us and others with their behavior, and they need us to set limits for them, because if we don't, they're gonna become more aggressive. And long term, if we don't set the right kind of limits with our kids, they're not going to develop certain capacities that they really need. And this includes having the resiliency inside to deal with life's ups and downs in the way they need to in order to be successful in life. In this video, I'm going to take all the mystery out of how to set limits the right way by teaching you my three top rules for proper limit setting with children. I'll show you how being either too strict or too lenient in your limit setting are both ineffective and how it actually takes a combination, a balance of being firm and compassionate that actually works. My hope is that by the end of this video, you see limit setting as something you can look forward to and something you feel good about because you understand it and you know how to do it well. My name is Todd Sarner and I'm a psychotherapist and parenting coach. And my mission is to provide parents like you with the education and resources you need to have the family life you've always wanted and to raise children that thrive. I thought I'd start off the video with a story based on an actual experience from one of my clients a little while back. It's the kind of story I hear just about every day. I was having a coaching session with some clients who I'll call Maggie and Tom. Maggie was telling me about something that had happened a few days before our session when she picked up their seven-year-old son after school. When he got in the car, he seemed a little mad, but he didn't want to talk about it. Maggie also had her baby daughter in the car and a lot of things on her mind that had to be done, so she didn't really push too much to find out more. She remembered that her son had been really irritable the night before. He was being very pokey in his behavior and he was complaining about everything, including everything his mom and his dad and his baby sister were doing. This led to a common argument with her husband Tom. She felt that their child's behavior was a sign that he wasn't getting enough attention and that they needed to make more of an effort to spend quality time time with him. Tom, on the other hand, felt like they spoiled him and that they were too lenient with setting limits with him and that this was the cause of his behavior. It was the same discussion between them every time. Maggie was thinking about all this in the car that day when they got to the store to pick up some things for dinner. She put her baby in a sling and grabbed the shopping cart and they all headed into the store. She told her son that they wouldn't be there that long and asked him to stay close by. She also told them that they were only getting what was on their grocery list and that they wouldn't be buying any treats that day. And as you might guess, the moment they went into the store, her son kept venturing off and not staying close as she had asked him to. And every time he came back, he had a new demand for a treat that he wanted. It got to the point where her son was getting so loud and so big about his demands that Maggie was afraid he was gonna lose it completely in the store. She tried to say no to him a lot of different ways, but it didn't seem to be working. When it seemed her son was on the verge of a total meltdown, Maggie gave in and she said, look, you can have one small treat and that's it, okay? Her son de-escalated immediately, having won the battle. Maggie felt horrible that she gave in because deep down she knew it wasn't the right thing, but she didn't think she had a choice. She at least felt some relief that her child came down from what seemed to be an imminent explosion. However, a couple of hours later at dinner, all of his big frustrated energy came back. Maggie and Tom started immediately arguing about what to do about it, and in the meantime, their son had a big screaming meltdown, including throwing his dinner plate to the ground. This is not an uncommon situation. We're gonna revisit this story after I tell you the rules of limit setting, and I'll show you where things could have gone much, much better. The relationship between frustration and aggression. Everyone gets frustrated. Sometimes it's small stuff, sometimes it's big stuff. It's just part of life. We cannot keep our kids from ever getting frustrated, but we can learn how to help them process and let go of this frustration. Frustration builds up and at some point it's gonna blow up into aggression, like hitting or kicking or telling you that they hate you. I tell my clients to imagine it's like their children have a sort of frustration tank inside and that all sorts of little and medium and big frustrations are going into that tank all day long. 
things that are really obvious to us, and probably some other things that we overlook or would think are no big deal as adults. If that frustration tank gets really full, your child is going to be aggressive. It's just gonna happen. As parents, a good mindset to have is that we are the manager of that frustration tank until our children can manage it themselves. Setting limits with kids is about managing that frustration tank so it doesn't spill over into aggression, but it's also about helping your children become adults who are emotionally resilient because they learn to notice when those feelings are building up in themselves and how to process them and how to let them go. And what do we usually see when somebody really feels their feelings and accepts them and stops fighting them and just lets them go? When a child really feels all that frustration inside related to all the things in their life that they couldn't do or couldn't be or couldn't have, it usually comes along with a big, healthy, getting it all out cry. It's crying and getting it out that signals that we have felt our feelings and accepted them and that we're ready to move on. And when this happens, people usually feel better. They get calmer, they're more grounded, they have better energy, and they have new ideas, and they're better able to solve problems. So with that in mind, let's talk about those three rules for proper limit setting with kids. Rule number one, embrace your role as a limit setter. Learning to embrace your role as a limit setter is partially a mindset thing, but it's also very practical and it's gonna help you out a lot. The first thing I'd tell you along these lines is that you should strive to never take your children's frustration or aggression personally, even if they're telling you in the moment that they hate you. Aggression is just a natural thing that occurs when a child isn't processing their frustration. The younger your children are, the more likely they are to hit and kick and bite and tantrum when they can't handle the amount of frustration that they're holding in their tank. But as they get older, they're gonna turn to things like whining and passive aggressiveness and sarcasm and using their words to hurt others. This is not personal, it's an eruption of emotions. If we take it personally, we are always gonna go down the wrong road in how we react to them. Another attitude or mindset to embrace is something I've seen work for countless parents, and that is to almost look forward to your children getting very frustrated because you see it as an opportunity to practice getting that frustration out, which is great for everyone. Rule number two, find the right time to set the limits. One of the most important but misunderstood aspects of how to set limits the right way is understanding the right time to set limits. This is where our frustration tank concept is gonna help us out a lot. If your child is like at a two or a three out of 10 in their frustration, they're probably not gonna to be too aggressive and they're not gonna give you too many problems. But if they're at a nine or a 10, they're gonna be very aggressive and you're probably not gonna handle it very well. The trick is to be aware of when your child's like at a six or a seven in their frustration. What this means is they're probably gonna start being a little provocative or irritable in their behavior. They're gonna start acting mildly aggressive and they're gonna start problems with people. If you see this behavior, you should be on high alert for opportunities to set limits with your child. If your parenting partner is around, make sure they know too that it's happening so that they're ready for it. When our parenting partners don't know what's happening, it leads to a lot of problems. You're over here noticing the six or seven behavior and trying to set a limit with your child, but then they run off to the other parent who doesn't know what's going on and maybe they say yes and now the opportunity is lost. Finding this sweet spot for setting limits is gonna be one of the most powerful things for you to understand in becoming more effective in setting them. Most parents just ignore the six or seven behaviors because they're busy or they're trying to avoid conflict with their kids. But when you don't recognize this behavior and you don't do something about it, it turns into an eight or a nine or a 10, and this is much harder to deal with. Now, speaking of the importance of timing, don't you think right now would be a great time to like this video and subscribe to our channel. This helps us focus our time on making more videos that are helpful to you and helps YouTube put videos in front of you that are more relevant to you. Rule number three, make the limits firm but compassionate. So now that you have the right mindset 
and you're aware of the right timing, it's time now to discuss the right way to actually set limits in the moment. There are two ingredients in your limit setting that are necessary to help kids feel their feelings and process them and let them go. The first ingredient that is necessary for proper limit setting is what my mentor Dr. Gordon Neufeld calls the agent of futility energy. What this means is when it's time to set a limit, you go in saying no and you say it in a way that is firm and clear and concise and consistent. You say no and you mean no and you stick to your no. The second ingredient for proper limit setting is what Dr. Neufeld calls the angel of comfort energy. What this means is when you're setting limits, you also show some compassion and some empathy for your child. You're saying no and you're sticking to it, but you also say words that let your children know that you love them and that you understand that they're frustrated. You should see this as a sort of dance that you're going to need to do from time to time with your child. They're going to push and push, they're not going to accept your no, and they're going to try to change your mind. They're gonna try to pull on your heartstrings sometimes, but your job is to stick with your firm but loving no. If your child was demanding ice cream for dinner, your job would be to say something like, no, you're not having ice cream. I know, honey, you really want it. I like ice cream too. But no, under no circumstances are you getting ice cream, and you just stick with it. In the dance, if they're not accepting the no, get a little more firm. If they seem really distraught or they say, you don't care, show a little bit more empathy. The key is to stay firm and clear and kind until they get to the point where they just give up fighting and they feel those frustrated feelings. And this is usually marked by a big, sometimes messy, getting it all out kind of cry. And when they get it out, they're calmer, they're more loving, and their whole being seems to change. Sometimes this acceptance gets a little bit more subtle, especially as they get older. But what we're looking for here is that moment where the fever just seems to break, and they just accept what they're feeling and they let it go. This doesn't just empty that frustration tank and give you potentially days of a more calm and less frustrated child. It's you helping your child build muscles of emotional adaptability and resilience that's going to serve them for life. Now that I've shared with you these three rules for effective limit setting, let's go back to the story that I shared with you at the beginning of the video about Maggie and Tom and their son and see how we can apply these rules to their situation. When I spoke to Maggie and Tom in our session, the first thing I focused on when it came to these rules was rule number two about timing and to a lesser extent rule number one about embracing their roles as limit setters. Going over the situation that day, it was pretty clear to me that Maggie and Tom had probably had some opportunities before the incident at the grocery store to set some limits with their son, but that they didn't take them. In the store that day, he was already at an eight or a nine, which is not ideal. And since they were in the store, that's not the best environment to set limits the right way and go through that back and forth dance of limit setting that I mentioned before. Sometimes parents are just gonna have to give in when the circumstances get to that place, but it's important to know you aren't emptying the frustration tank. In that case, you're only delaying the explosion and the child is still likely to blow up later, like what happened with Maggie and Tom. The main advice I gave them was to look for those six or seven level opportunities that had happened the night before and earlier in the day and that's where it was their job to come together as a team to provide the firmness and the clarity and the empathy it takes to get those feelings out. I talked to them and encouraged them to look for these moments where their son was getting irritable or frustrated in his behavior and be excited to have the opportunity to practice setting limits as a team that were firm and and compassionate for his sake as much as anything. And finally, I talked specifically to Tom about increasing the empathy that he was showing when he was trying to set limits and talked to Maggie about increasing the clarity and the firmness of how she was trying to set limits. We're looking for that. We're looking for a balance in ourselves and between ourselves as a parenting team to set those limits the right way. That's our video. I hope it was helpful. Just go out there and practice these rules. Now check out the description below for links to other videos related to this topic and other helpful resources for you as a parent. And please leave your comments and questions below. I swear I read every single one. And as always, please let us know what topics you'd like us to cover in future videos. 
Today's parenting quote is by someone you hear about a lot on my channel, my mentor in the parenting realm, Dr. Gordon Neufeld, the author of Hold On To Your Kids. He said, no matter how bad your child's behavior, it's a cry for help. Sometime the behavior requires a firm limit, but it never requires us to be mean. I find that this is really true. Thank you for being here. I hope to see you soon.